All right. So again, hi, everyone. My name is Salata, and today's webinar topic will be how to start building your wealth through investing presented by Aaron from First Generation Investors. So take it away, Aaron. Thank you so much, Salata. So I'm just going to share my screen with everybody. Um, it should work now. Thank you so much. All right, we're on. Um, first of all, thank you, Salote. Um, it's great to be here representing First Generation Investors. Um, good afternoon to everybody on the West Coast. Um, you know, I hope everybody's staying safe and everybody's staying indoors during this unprecedented time. Um, and I hope we're staying busy and we're staying engaged. Um, and I think, you know, you know, tuning into a topic like this, one that's challenging, one that we're going to learn a lot about, um, is just a testament to you guys and to staying active during this period. Um, so just briefly about myself, um, so I'm currently a senior studying uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, and I'm also the head tutor um, at FGI uh, with the Penn chapter. FGR, for those of you that don't know, we teach an eight-week investing course to students just like you guys all over the country, um, and we actually give people real money, students like you guys real money, so they, they could take what they learned in the class and apply it um, to real investing. So today what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that eight week course and we're gonna condense it into 20 minutes. Um, so it's gonna be challenging, we're gonna push you guys, um, but that's why at the end we're gonna do a Q&A and that's really when we're gonna learn. Um, that's when we can dig into those issues, we can fill the gaps of our knowledge. Um, so you know, don't be alarmed if you don't get everything at first. Um, this is gonna be an intense class, but it's gonna be really rewarding as well. So let's kick it off. So what's gonna be on the agenda today? Um, so the first thing, some to build the foundation we're going to go over a couple terms we're going to talk about what you hear the term like stock and share all the time what does that really mean um, and then we're going to learn i think three really important topics um, the first and powerful topic is going to be you know why do we want to invest what's in it for us very much linked to this question is going to be the question well what's in it for the company why does a company give us you know a percentage of their future cash flows um, why do they give us share Okay, and we're gonna explain what that means. And then finally, okay, so investing is something that's really powerful. Um, how can we get involved in it in a really safe way as non-professionals? Students that go about our days, hang out with friends, learning things, and we're not experts in the market, but we still can invest in a safe way. And we're gonna talk about how to do that. So what's a stock? You may have heard the term stock, share, um, equity. Those are fancy finance terms. But what I want you to take away is what it really means is ownership. But when we talk about ownership, we don't talk about ownership in the sense of how you own your car. When you own your car, you could drive it around everybody, everywhere. You could take it in the neighborhood. You can go pick up food. Um, you have complete control over that car. When you have ownership in a company, so when you buy stock in a company, you don't own it in the sense where, let's say you own a share of Amazon. You can't call Jeff Bezos and say, hey, Jeff, he's the CEO of Amazon, by the way. He runs the company. You can't say, Jeff, I want you to close this warehouse and open this warehouse. I want you to sell this shirt, but not that shirt. We can't make operating decisions. So when we talk about ownership in the sense, what we really mean is we get a share of the future profits of the company. And don't worry, we're going to break this down in an example. But let's say a flower company, right, makes a million dollars and you own 1% of that flower company, then you get $10,000. And so it's pretty intuitive, I think, why it's beneficial for us to own stocks. Well, we own shares of a company and we get their future cash flows. So if the company is extremely successful, we share in that success. We get you know, some of those cash flows. The next obvious question then is, okay, Jeff Bezos owns 100% of Amazon, this amazing company. Why would he ever give up 1% of it? Why would he give us, you know, just like you and me, a percentage of the future cash flows? Well, let's go to the lemonade stand uh, example that we're gonna talk about forever. Sorry, not forever, just throughout this uh, lesson. So let's say you guys have an amazing recipe for lemonade, the best in California. So you wanna start a lemonade stand, makes sense. You're an expert in lemonade, your family, friends love it. But even with that expertise, you can't just start a lemonade stand. You're gonna need a pitcher, you're gonna need water, you're gonna need sugar, you're gonna need a table, um, you're gonna need marketing material, you may have to hire people. So you have all these expenses, all these costs up front in order to start the company. Well, not too long ago, Amazon was in the same problem. They had this amazing idea that would soon to be a trillion dollar company. Um, but they needed money in the beginning. So they go, so they go, so Jeff Bezos or other people are going to go, whoever are starting a company and say, look, I want to, let's say, start a lemonade stand. I need money right now. And you say, sure, I'll give you money. It sounds like a great idea, but you're not going to give money for free, right? No. So the lemonade stand person says, okay, 
give me your money and I don't have money to pay you back now, but I'll pay you back later when the company is successful, how you'll get a percentage of my future profits. If you could walk away understanding those two concepts, why it's beneficial for us to own shares in a company, to have, you know, the, to be part of the future success of a company and understand why it's beneficial for a company to give shares to investors so that they can raise money and invest in themselves. It's a really powerful tool for understanding how our economy works. We went through the lemonade sample example. We'll revisit it later. I think we should hammer home uh, this lemonade stand example with some numbers. Don't worry so much about the math, about the math, but we'll walk away understanding the concept. So Alex has the best recipe in California, and Alex approaches her friends Dylan and Cole and says, "I need two dollars and fifty cents each from you guys." Dylan Cole says, "You know what? Fine. Sounds like a great idea." So gives them the two dollars and fifty cents each, but. They say, look, we're not gonna give you it for free, Alex. What's in it for us? Alex says, okay, I'll give you 25% of the company. In other words, I'll give you 25% of the future profits of the company. Great. So Alex once had 100% of the company, gave 25% to Dylan and 25% to Cole. Now Alex only has 50% of the company. Now what happens? Lemonade stands a huge success. The weather's amazing. People are loving it. It's the best lemonade ever. Alex opens the piggy bank a year from now and sees $20 in the piggy bank. Well, what happens to everybody's wealth? Dylan, who had 25% of the company, now gets 25% of $20, $5. Cole, same thing. Alex, only has 50% of the company left. Alex gets 50% of $20, $10. How is everybody impacted? Well, what happened was Dylan doubled his money. So did Cole. They both put in $2.50 and they got, and they ended up with $5. Alex, despite giving up 50% of the company, his equity increased. So in the beginning, you know, he had close to $0. Now he's got 50% of $20, he has $10. What I want you to walk away with here is two powerful concepts. Let's start with the investor side. We have the investors and we have the company. Let's start with Dylan and Cole. One, if Dylan and Cole had $2.50 sitting in their bank accounts, they knew they weren't gonna touch it for the rest of the year and they left it in their bank account, it would've only made you know, not a lot of money, if any at all, okay? But by giving their money to other people, $2.50 to other people, now they turn around, you know, and they see that their money doubled. And this is while living their normal daily lives. They went to school, they, you know, worked maybe, and, you know, they had fun with friends. We talked about in the beginning how ownership doesn't mean operating the company, but that's a benefit here. They don't have to operate the lemonade stand in order to make money. They just give money to Alex and Alex does that for them. So they doubled their money without really putting in any effort. Alex, so now going to the company side, the powerful concept here is that it's worth it a lot of times to give up ownership in order to take money initially if you think your company is going to grow. So despite losing 50% of his company to other investors, you know, 100% of $0 in the, for Alex would have been $0, whereas 50% of $20 is $10. So Alex benefited because he took in money and because she took in money and grew the company. So the obvious question here is, okay, well, what if the company does badly? No investment is a sure thing. For every good company, there's a lot of companies that don't do well. For instance, let's go back to the lemonade stand. Well, what if there was terrible weather and nobody wanted to buy lemonade? So Alex, after a year, opens up the piggy bank and sees not $20, but $0. Both Cole and Dylan would have lost $2.50, and Alex would have 50% of $0, so would also have $0. Um, Again, the next obvious question is, well, how do you determine if a company is gonna be successful or not? What I'm about to show you is, it's really hard to answer that question, especially for people like you and me who are not experts in investing, and that's okay. Because we're gonna talk about some ways to safely invest our money, to protect ourselves from this downside, protect, from this downside risk that's often very unpredictable. Now, just to talk about something really quickly, um, so we can move forward with the lecture is, um, we're gonna go through a couple graphs. All I want you to take away from the graph is if the graph's moving upwards, um, then that means the company's doing well, it's increasing in value. If the, if the graph's moving downwards, the company's decreasing in value. Just like with the squares, if the square was getting bigger, think about it now the graph line is moving up, just like that. Okay, let's look at a real world example. We know the company Snapchat, right? I, I'm sure all you guys know it, um, I know it as well. Well, in 2018, um, in February, Kylie Jenner tweeted, so does anyone else not open Snapchat anymore? Or is it just me? Ugh, this is so sad. Right when that news hit, the stock dropped 6%, okay? It lost basically immediately $1.3 billion in value. 
what I want you to take away is away from this is is this right a lot of times what determines the value of the company is out of our control and is very unpredictable so if you decided to invest in snapchat just like the lemonade stand for all the right reasons you thought it was gonna be great companies great management it's in a great market all those things something like so unpredictable like a tweet could just drop the value of the company and that's really out of our control and so again how do we protect ourselves from this second real world example this is about apple everybody knows apple right so in you know January of this year, some analysts, basically professionals that dedicate all their time to figuring this out, predicted that in one quarter, Apple would sell $51 billion um, worth of iPhones, okay? Shortly after, Apple released a statement and said, we actually sold 50, basically $56 billion, okay? And because the, the result was higher than the expectation, Apple's stock went up 2.8%. So even something that's more closely related to value, like sales of iPhones and how much Apple's worth, than to Snapchat and like a tweet, is still very hard to, to understand in terms of value. What I'm trying to say is this, is even experts who dedicate all their time to figuring out how many iPhones Apple will sell got it wrong. So how could we expect to get it right ourselves, right? How could we expect to price Apple correctly and make money on Apple when we're just everyday students? Again, the answer is going to be we have to protect our downside and we have to protect against uncertainty. So how are we going to do that? The answer is diversification. Diversification is an extremely powerful concept in finance. And we're going to talk about it through the, the lens of a farmer to kind of understand this, how we could protect ourselves from the the Apple scenario in which it's hard to price things and the Snapchat scenario in which we can't predict if someone, let's say, is going to tweet something about us. Well, let's say you're a farmer in Idaho, right? And all you do is sell corn. You're undiversified in what you sell. Why? And sorry. And also you're vulnerable. Why? Because let's say there's a plague that hits corn. You have nothing to sell now. You're probably going to go bankrupt. But let's say you decide to diversify as in not just sell corn, but you decide to sell tomatoes, pumpkins, carrots, other vegetables. If something happens to the corn, you could still sell other vegetables, most likely, because what's going to impact the corn probably won't impact the other vegetables. And so you'll be just fine. Diversification essentially means different things or many things that are different. And let's see how it applies to stocks. Okay. So if you just invested in Snapchat and the tweet came out about Snapchat, you lost 6%. If you invested in these nine other companies and the tweet came out about Snapchat, Snapchat's value went down, but the other nine companies probably weren't affected by Kylie Jenner's tweet because it had nothing to do with them. So let's say you had $900, right? You put all $900 in Snapchat and you lose 6% of value. So you lost $54. But if you took that $900 and you separated between nine companies, so $100 in each company and just Snapchat went down 6%, well then you only lost $6. So it's a $54 loss versus a $6 loss. Why? Because you're protecting yourself with diversification. Right now, you guys are looking at a graph. This is an index. It's the S&P 500. First, let me explain what the S&P 500 is. And then we'll, you know, we'll explain some key takeaways from, from just this graph. So the S&P 500 measures the average of the top 500 um, companies in the U.S., um, and this right here uh, measures their performance from 1870 to 2017. So it's not current. So it's not totally current, but you'll get the takeaways just from this graph. The S&P 500 is extremely diversified. I just showed you a diversification example with just nine companies. Well, you can invest in the S&P 500. So 500 of the top U.S. companies. And what that means is, firstly, that it's if one company does badly in the S&P 500, so one out of 500 the other 499 could still do pretty well. So that's just fine. And so you're not gonna see huge ups and downs in the S&P 500, it's gonna be extremely steady. What you see here are a couple big drops you saw in 2000 with the dot-com bubble and you saw in 2008 um, with the mortgage crisis, we're currently experiencing one now with COVID. The second big takeaway I want, I want to get across is even with these occasional big dips, over the long term, if you're patient, the S&P 500 gives you a really good return. It's been measured at 7% on an annual basis over the long run. So if you invest in the S&P 500, 20 years ago, $100, you're gonna make around $380, so probably a little more. If you invest $10,000, you're gonna make over $38,000 in 20 years, okay? And that's really powerful because 
if every day when, when you start work and you start, you know, making money yourself, so you put a little bit of money away into the S&P 500, 10 years later, 20 years later, the returns that you can get could be enough to pay for an education, can be enough to pay for a car, and can help you with a lot of expenses. The point I want to get across here is the S&P 500 and investing in diversified equities is a really safe and lucrative thing in the long term. You can make a lot of money in a safe way. Um, and that's why it's really important for people like you and me entering the workforce, coming of age, to understand the benefit of that. So I just threw a ton at you guys. I expect a lot of great questions. Um, let's go over just some key takeaways before we jump into the Q&A. So the first powerful concept we learned, we invest our money in order to grow our wealth over time. We get a percentage of the future profits, hopefully of a sex successful company. Secondly, we learned why companies want to give us ownership. Because in order to grow themselves, they need to take money from others. They need to buy supplies, lemonade supplies, let's say. And thirdly, we learned that it's really difficult to predict whether a company is going to do well or not, right? So how do we protect ourselves from that? The way we protect ourselves, we protect ourselves in for, is by investing in a lot of companies all at once. We diversify. That way, if one company doesn't do well, the other ones can do well and we'll be safe. Now, fourthly, we learned that investing over the long term, being patient, even through the downside cycles, the S&P 500 will give us a good return in the long run, around 7% annually. And with that, um, I want to open up for questions. Um, one thing about questions, um, just to reiterate, everything's anonymous. So I'm not going to say your name if you answer a question. And secondly, you should ask questions because questions is how we learn. It's how we fill the gaps in our knowledge. And it's really digging into the materials when you learn. Um, so be courageous, ask questions. I'm going to field all the questions and I'm excited for them. Lastly, sorry, before you get into questions, what should you do now? I hope I really just piqued your interest. I don't expect everybody to learn how to be an investor today. I'm still learning every single day. So what should you do? What I recommend and what I, I try to do every day is read, read, read. The more you read, the more you're going to be exposed to these topics, the better it's going to be. So on the, on the left side here, I, um, I put some sources. You can read the Wall Street Journal Business, New York Times Business, CNBC, Financial Times, etc. Read, write down your questions, look up your questions on Google, talk to people that you think know, that know what they're talking about. Um, and slowly over time, everything's going to make a lot more sense if you continue to read and ask questions. Um, and then, sorry, lastly, if you're the, the great thing about investing to me is if you're someone that's interested in a lot of things and you're extremely curious, whether it's technology or retail or manufacturing, investing is the right place for you because you get to touch upon all those topics all at once. Um, so it can be really, really fulfilling in that way. And with that, um, thank you so much. Um, follow First Generation Investors on social media, and I'm excited for your questions. Sorry, I'm just going to share my screen one more time. Okay, looking through questions. Okay, so the first question I'm going to field um, is going to be, a question came in, a really great question is, um, what are the benefits and cons of investing in startups or smaller companies? So a couple things. Um, so first of all, in the realm of investing in companies that we're talking about now, we're talking about investing in public companies. So these are companies that retail investors, as they call it, you and me can invest in. Um, a lot of startups are still private companies, um, which means they wouldn't take money from you and me. But in a general sense, what's the benefit or downside to, let's say, just looking at public companies to invest in a smaller company or a larger company? Um, a lot of times, larger companies will theoretically be safer, not all the time. 
um, because they're just harder to lose, let's say their market position. It's much harder to see a company like Google or um, CVS, these large companies kind of get moved out of the market. So they're much safer. On the other side of that, a small company, um, you could see a lot more growth. For instance, if you invested in like Apple when they were a very small company, they can grow to a huge company to they are now. So it's all about your appetite for risk. How much are you willing to lose versus gain? How much do you want to just to save investment? And so that's kind of the one trade off to think about when investing in small or large companies. Okay. So another great question, which I spoke very theoretically about, but it, it, it kind of, this opens the door to speak more about it. The question was, is a stock a one-time payment or is it an annual payment? So interestingly enough, the answer is neither. So when you invest in a public company or a stock, you're investing on what's called the secondary market most of the time. Or for us as retail investors, we're always investing in the secondary market, which means we're buying stocks from each other. So if I if I buy a stock at a hundred dollars for one share, okay, I'm buying a stock, I'm paying a hundred dollars and I get one share. Most of the time with companies is they're not gonna give me money. They're not gonna just give me money once a year or once a month. What's going to happen is they're going to take the money and they're going to put it back into the company. But when the company gets more valuable, that value gets reflected in the price of each share. So that if, if the company is truly getting more valuable, if its cash flows are growing, let's say the share may go from $100 a share to $150 a share. I'm going to then sell the share for $150 and make the difference. A couple of things. One, we, we live in a world in which the secondary market is very what we call liquid. You could basically mostly find anybody else on the other side of the deal. When I sell the stock for $150, somebody else thinks it's going to go more beyond that. And I obviously think it's not going to go more. And so I'm willing to cash out. When I spoke hypothetically about um, you get a percentage of the future cash flows, that could be the case if they, then, if they decide to, let's say, pay a dividend, give you money. Don't worry about that concept. But really, it's reflected in the value of the share. You know, one way I was talking about theoretically, how you actually make money is you, let's say, make a bet on the company, the share price goes up and you sell it. Um, yes. Okay. Can I touch upon what's going on um, with the stock market lately? Seems a bit crazy. Great question. Um, we made the presentation well beyond what was going on. And obviously, this is an unprecedented time for the stock market. So happy to touch upon some current events. Um, okay, so everybody knows about COVID-19. It's a huge health crisis, and it's, um, it's disrupting things all over the world. Um, and it's, you know, taking lives, and that's very sad. Another way to look at it is through the lens of the stock market, how it's impacting the stock market. Um, so when the, the crisis first came out, it originated in Asia. That impacted the US stock market in one big way in that it was what's called the supply shock. As in companies, let's say like Apple, a lot of the times they create their iPhone by taking, by sourcing things from Asia. Well, when the, when the COVID disaster was happening in Asia, nobody was allowed to go into factories. Basically the economy was shut down. And this disrupted companies like Apple that rely on companies in Asia. And so Apple wasn't able to create iPhones and that really hurt a company like Apple. Then the, the crisis, the health crisis came to the U.S. and we're all having to stay at home. What that means is businesses are stopped and demand for goods really stopped. So this is one of those rare events where it's really impacting all companies. We talked about how we could protect from specific risks like, you know, a Snapchat or, or um, like Snapchat tweeting or let's say one retail company going down. Well, when nobody is buying anything and everybody's staying indoors, um, this really affects all companies. And so what you saw is starting really from February you, for U.S. stocks till now, it's gone up in the past couple of days, but the stocks have crashed about like 20%, uh, 30%, the, the fastest crash we've seen um, since the depression. Um, things have come up um, uh, lately. Uh, last two days, I think it's up 8%. Um, but it's a really actually interesting time to monitor how current events are impacting stocks. Next question.
Um, okay, what are your some thoughts on um, and tips and strategies of when to sell a share? That's obviously um, a really important question. And if I had all the answers or a crystal ball, um, I'd be very, very wealthy, but that's not the case. So I'll just give you my, my best takes and I think some two takeaways you can have. One is from Warren Buffett. Um, actually, I think both are from Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett is like the most successful um, long-term investor ever. Um, and he really kind of lived by, live, lives by two mantras. One, he says, invest when people are scared and sell when everybody's excited. Um, and that connects to his second mantra, which he's a long-term investor. So he wants to buy shares when people are panicked and he thinks there's an overreaction in the market where shares are down, you know, maybe more than they're supposed to be. And the second thing is he's going to hold for the long term. So you're, you're not going to win in the stock market, especially not you and me. If we decide to sell a share today and then buy a share tomorrow and then sell a share today, because on a day-to-day -day basis, things are really unpredictable. So what I recommend when it comes to selling or buying shares is hold things for a long time. Pick a company that you think is undervalued for whatever reason, and you think is going to be successful three, four, five, ten 10 years out. That's what like one of the most successful investor does and try to ignore what happens on a daily day basis because I can't give you the answer. I can't tell you when to sell a stock. It's really hard to determine, but what you can bet on is that over the long term, the value will be realized in the company and the share, the stock of the, the, the price of the, of the, of the stock will be, I think, true to the value of the company. Okay, let's see how much more time I have, more, more questions. These are all great questions. Um, which stocks do you recommend investing in the quarantine? I'm very glad that everybody's up to date with the quarantine. Again, if I had the crystal ball, it'd be amazing. Um, I think what I would like to pivot this question, if I can, is what are some of the trends we're seeing with this quarantine? Well, let's think of the economy like this. Um, if nobody can go outside and everybody is hunkered down at home, you're seeing companies that have to do with telecommunication doing very well. For instance, the, the platform we're using right now is Zoom. Zoom has been one of the few companies that has really benefited economically from COVID-19 because more people need to use the platform. Less people are going to work on a day-to-day -day basis um and more people are using zoom so it's benefited now i'm not telling you to go buy zoom right now because it could be that zoom is fully priced in meaning that everybody's already went and bought zoom shares and so the price of zoom is really really expensive right now let's say zoom shares are at 200 dollars right now okay when you buy a share of zoom today it doesn't matter what their past success was it really doesn't matter that things are hot right now because of COVID-19. What you're betting on is that tomorrow, three, four, five years from now, they're gonna be over $200. So you have to determine if all their value is already baked into the stock price today, or if there's still value to, to be had. But I encourage you to think through trends like that and how COVID may be impacting other companies. Um, but still, I'd like to stress the fact that it's really hard to predict which companies are gonna benefit. There are professionals that spend their entire lives trying to answer these questions. And it would be not wise for us to compete with those people. Why? Because like I said, every time you buy a, company, buy a share in a company, you're betting with the person across from you that it's gonna go up and they're betting it's gonna go down. What if the person across from you has 50 more years of experience and you know, has been doing this all their lives and does it every day. It's like me trying to play basketball one-on-one -on -one with LeBron James. It's just not going to work. So instead, what we can do is we can invest in the S&P 500. We can invest in really diversified equities. And we know that over the long term, they're going to go up. And it's a safe investment that we don't have to watch on a daily day basis. And we can go and do our, our what we want to do on our daily lives. We can work. We can make money. We can have fun. And our money is actually being put to work on the side for us. And it's making money. Um, without having us having to operate or do anything. And that's a really powerful concept. Um, and that's the most powerful concept I want to get across rather than stock picking. Let's see. I encourage you to keep throwing in questions. I still think we have a little bit of time. Um,
Yeah, so I talked about how I talked about how stocks, you know, can be impacted by things like weather um, and other things like that. And the question is, you know, what's the long-term trajectory? I think that's a great question to um, to to leave off on before I hand it back to Saloni, which is that um, in the short run, stocks may go down for things like a tweet or weather, but what we really care about is staying humble and staying calm over the long term. Um, and over the long term, if you look at the S&P 500 over the last, over, you know, 60 years, on an annual basis each year, it's it should go up around 7%. So with that, I'll hand it back over. Um, I think you guys may have a quiz, but don't worry, it's not graded. It's, it's just for your enjoyment, I think. Thank you so much, Aaron, for sharing all of this great information on how to invest for our students. Um, everyone, I'm going to be launching a post poll for you all. Um, just five questions to help us know um, as an organization if you got anything out of this webinar um, so that we can then know what to set up in the future. So if you could take the next two minutes to fill that out, uh, that would be great. Okay. 